Squared U.S. All right. Hi. Welcome, everybody. I'm John Donvan. I'm the host and moderator of Intelligence Squared U.S., and we're just going to have a very brief chat to talk about this partnership and this relationship and our being here. Ian, it, it's, it's a pleasure for us to be part of this event. Well, thank you very much, John. Um, it's really a pleasure for us. And the issue, as you'll see, that we're going to discuss is one that is, I mean, obviously one of the most vexing ones on the international agenda, uh, whether we're talking about Syria or events in Africa or elsewhere. And it's also been our Brussels Forum agenda for many years. Uh, so it makes it important. But the, the other thing is simply this has been a great partnership. And uh, I know the two institutions with Intelligence Squared and GMF, we share this interest in objective, reasoned, uh, informed debate. And so in that sense, we couldn't have possibly had a better partner. Robert, thank you very much indeed uh, to you and to your team. And we look forward to this very much. Well, thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here. And uh, uh, I think we can all take uh, some pleasure in the idea that at least in America, there's a big audience for this kind of of debate. Uh, we have over a million people who engage with us regularly on public radio and podcast and uh, television network program. And uh, so it's really an honor to bring this uh, here and uh, to, to such a knowledgeable and informed audience. And we've done, at this point at Bob, more than 145 debates. But how does this one fit into sort of the, the, the pattern of what we do? Well, it's sort of interesting because I think this debate will turn to some degree on the tension between idealism and pragmatism. And we've done a number of debates that, that kind of had that as the gravamen of the, uh, of the argument. Uh, we did one on aid to Africa does more harm than good. Uh, we did uh, one on the US should admit 100,000 Syrian refugees. In a slightly different context, lifespans are long enough. Uh, so th this is within an intellectual tradition uh, for us. And yet, of course, as Ian says, it's incredibly timely. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. You can take your seats. And I'm going to have a little bit of a chat with the audience before we actually start. Thank you so much. And again, Ian, thanks so much for having us here. Um, so, as I mentioned, I wanted to have a little bit of a chat with you to tell you who we are and what we do. I'll do this in, I hope, under two minutes. Um, we're actually, we, as I mentioned, have done more than 140 of these programs. And we, uh, I want to point out that, number one, we are producing and always do produce, uh, while we're doing this, a radio show, a podcast, and a television program. So you are part of that. Um, and I also want to point out that this is a competitive event. It's not a panel discussion. There are two teams here who are trying to persuade you of their point of view. And to that end, I want to let you know that we're going to ask you to choose the winner. Uh, in addition to asking questions, you get to pick the winner. But I would like you to listen not only critically, but with enthusiasm and with a certain amount of boisterousness. The, the uh, audience that hears this would, will benefit from knowing that you are here, that you are acting as judges. And so I want to encourage you to, at various points throughout the program, when I specifically ask for it, to, uh, to applaud. So I'll do one of these. And it's my asking you to applaud spontaneously, however. <laughs> Um, but also, if you hear points you like, it's not like a U.S. presidential debate where you need to sit on your hands. If you hear a point that you support and like, feel free to applaud. We encourage that, and it helps the debaters know how they're doing. We can do a little practice run like that right now. Yeah. Okay. All right. It's not quite the New York City crowd, but it's almost there. So, so you know what you're up against. Um, the other thing is I want to ask you to, to do your preliminary vote now. Uh, if you go to, to the Brussels Forum app, uh, look at interactivity, and then you scroll down a little bit, you'll find that, and then make the choice to vote. And you will be presented with uh, our resolution, which is humanitarian intervention does more harm than good. And you can, at this point, tell us what you believe about this resolution. If you agree with it, vote yes. And if you disagree, vote that you are against. Sorry, it's for, against, and undecided. Vote for. You're for the motion, for the resolution, you're against the resolution, or you're undecided, which is a perfectly reasonable starting position to hold. 
So we'll let, leave that open for a few minutes. For those of you who might come in late, you can do that or you can complete the process. But I'd like to get the show on the road and at this point actually begin the formal program, the part that will be part of our radio show podcast and television program. And you can help me out with that. Uh, one other thing, I just want, there's a structure to this. We have timed rounds. I, uh, I have the, uh, and assume the right to interview debaters who are going off topic. Uh, who are taking too much time to make their point because we would like to keep things back and forth. So I want to tell you ahead of time so that no one is offended by it that I'm interrupting in order to keep things uh, moving along. So uh, no offense to anyone. But if we could launch things now with uh, a round of applause, I would appreciate it. Thank you. It has gone down in history as a case of moral failure on a massive scale the genocide nearly a quarter century ago in the African state of Rwanda, where up to a million people were slaughtered while the outside world watched what was going on and did almost nothing to stop it. And yet out of that catastrophe came new impetus for a concept called humanitarian intervention. The idea, the principle that when a state is unable or failing to protect its own people from genocide and crimes against humanity, then other states have a moral responsibility to go in to protect the vulnerable and to use military force if necessary. And a quarter century on, how has that principle worked out in practice? In places where it's been tried, say, Kosovo or Libya, does the record show that on balance such interventions are successful? Or on balance, do unintended consequences take over and undermine the goal? And right now, with what's going on in Syria, what's unfolding there, does the past argue for humanitarian intervention there or the opposite? Well, we think this has the makings of a debate, so let's have it. Yes or no to this statement, humanitarian intervention does more harm than good. I'm John Donvan of Intelligence Squared US. It is a pleasure to be at the Brussels Forum in partnership with the German Marshall Fund. We have four superbly qualified debaters who will argue for and against the resolution. As always, our debate goes in three rounds, and then this audience votes to choose the winner, and only one side wins. Let's bring on our debaters with a round of applause. First, Frank Ledwich. <laughs> Rokhan Manin. <laughs> Bernard Kushner. <laughs> Corey Shackey. Our resolution, again, is this humanitarian intervention does more harm than good. We have a team that will be arguing in support of the motion. Let's meet them, get a little, to know them a little bit. Please, again, let's please welcome Frank Ledwich. That was one of those. Uh, Frank, you are a senior fellow at the Royal Air Force College. You worked in military intelligence. You also write a lot. Uh, you had a great uncle who happened to have the same name as you, Frank Ledwidge. He was a military man. He was also a renowned writer. He was a, a poet of World War I who died fighting in that war. So obviously you did not have the chance to know him. But do you feel a connection to that, Frank? Yeah, absolutely, John. But what has to be said is that what we suffered over the last 15 years was nothing to what they did in the uh, First World War. Okay, getting a, a sense of your theme right away. I'd like to now introduce your partner again, Rajan Menon. Ladies and gentlemen, Rajan Menon. Rajan, welcome to Intelligence Squared. You're a professor at City College. You're also a senior research scholar at Columbia University. I happen to know that for you to be here in Brussels today, you needed to get a colleague to cover one of your classes. So obviously that worked out, but what price did you have to pay? Well, I will not divulge his name, but the secret is a good bottle of single malt scotch. Works every time. <laughs> so, so it worked out for everybody. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, the team arguing for the motion. Now let's meet the team arguing against the motion, which again is humanitarian intervention does more harm than good. Please first welcome Bernard Kushner. Bernard, you are former foreign minister of France, renowned as the co-founder of Doctors Without Borders. Little known fact to many, I think, that as a youth, uh, you went to Cuba and you went fishing with Fidel Castro. Uh, with the important question being, was the fishing good? Yes, I did. Yeah, it went well? But it was not the purpose of my travel. We understand. <laughs> Sorry to say. But it worked out. Ladies and gentlemen, Bernard Kushner. <laughs> 
And Corey Shackey, welcome to Intelligence Squared, also debating against the motion. It's great to have you back. You've debated with us before. You're Deputy Director General of the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, you are a regular on a podcast I love called Deep State Radio, <laughs> where you are often awarded the tiara of optimism. That's right, I what, is, it. What, is the, what is the tiara of optimism? Uh, it is a confidence that problems can be solved, that people make choices and choices make history, instead of uh, a deterministic conclusion of that question. So you are almost wearing the tiara right now. I always wear it. Okay, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, the team are doing against the motion. So let's move on to round one. Round one are opening statements by each debater in turn. They will be five minutes each. And here to start us off in round one, our first debater who will argue in support of the resolution, humanitarian intervention does more harm than good, Rajan Menon. He is professor at the City College of New York and senior research scholar at Columbia University. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, Rajan Menon. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Before you get boisterous, because John told you to be, I should tell you that <coughs> Frank and I will sound a little bit like Grinch at a Christmas dinner. And the reason for that is, who wants to hear, after all, that humanitarian war does more harm than good? This is a project that saves lives, that ends atrocities, and invokes universal human rights. It is an idea that should unify the world. Alas, it has divided it and divided it deeply on fundamental issues. Who has the right to intervene? Under what circumstances? With what objective? To stop atrocities and end there? Or to then overthrow the regime, as happened in Libya? Or to stop atrocities and midwife the birth of a new state, as happened in Kosovo? These issues have not been resolved. Now, critics of humanitarian intervention worry about something else, and that is, will this ostensibly universal principle be applied universally in practice or bent and twisted by the powerful and applied selectively? They, are, they have good reason to be worried. If you are a great power, the United States, China, Russia, you do not have to fear intervention directed against you no matter what you do. Consider Russia and Chechnya in 94. If you are a middle power, India, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Israel, Egypt, you don't have to worry about intervention either because you've got the military muscle to make an intervention costly. So who does that leave? A miserable gaggle of friendless, isolated states they, ladies and gentlemen, will be on the receiving end of this universal principle. I'll give you some examples. Saudi Arabia today is waging a ruinous and vicious war in Yemen. Let's put the strategic issues aside. Hundreds of people have died in airstrikes by the Saudis. They have put down a blockade that has contributed to a cholera epidemic that has afflicted one million people. One million. Ten million people are on the brink of starvation. Have you heard anyone, even from the humanitarian intervention camp, calling for penalties against Saudi Arabia? No, they're arming the Saudis. And as we speak, the crown prince is being received by Her Majesty's government. Let's look at another example, Myanmar. The government of Myanmar has killed 7,000 Rohingya, and the toll is mounting, and chased 600 others out of their homes. Do you think the government of Myanmar is worried about the hoofbeats of humanitarian intervention? The generals lie in bed worrying? Not at all, because they have China in their corner. Now, I wanted to speak about another problem that humanitarian intervention faces, and that is the law not just of unintended consequences, but uncontrollable consequences, uncontrollable consequences. Only one example, because the clock is ticking, and that is Libya. Libya, post-intervention, is a violent, anarchic mess. Two governments, a multitude of militias, 
Al-Qaeda and ISIS with chapters newly created in Libya. The entire neighborhood is threatened. Tens of thousands of refugees, tens of thousands of refugees have fled across the Mediterranean, pumping up the power of right-wing populist parties in Europe. Look at what is happening in Europe today. Now, I want to finish with Bosnia and Kosovo that I haven't talked about. They teach us one lesson. If you want even a modicum of stability post-intervention, you have to keep tens of thousands of troops on the ground, spend billions of dollars to do it right. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that in the body politic of the West, and certainly in the United States, there isn't the political support to do it. Now, are the paragons of humanitarian intervention worried about this? Not at all. They have overweening confidence in their idea. That overweening confidence, ladies and gentlemen, slides sometimes into hubris, and that is yet another reason why this project, this noble project, does more harm than good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. And that again is the resolution, humanitarian intervention does more harm than good, and here to make his opening statement against the resolution, Bernard Kushner, co-founder of Doctors Without Borders and former French foreign minister. Thank you very much. Does humanitarian intervention does more harm than good? Not at all. You were talking, and this is a big mistake, about military intervention, not humanitarian. It doesn't mean anything, humanitarian intervention. Let me give you some examples. The first one, yes, sir, you were talking about Rwanda. April 94. Sorry to say I was there during all the genocide with my people, doctors and medical staff. And we did a lot compared to the genocide, compared to, let's say, 8,100 of dead people massacre. It was nothing. But believe me, humanitarian intervention is not a problem of numbers of dead or victims. If you can save one, and if it is your daughter or your sister or your father, this is a very important one. Humanitarian means human being. Human being, you have to count one after one. So it's not a question of military intervention. You were right in some of your examples. But we were before, and in Kosovo, we were before the humanitarian people working with the people, not with the government. There was no government, it was the Serbian government. So this is easy to counter-attack all your example. Afghanistan, but it, we were since 20 years working with the people. And there is a, still an hospital in Kabul, bombed every day, with explosion every day in Kabul. But the French hospital is still working without the government's help at all. So humanitarian intervention is not a military intervention. Neutrality is the rule. When we were working in Lebanon, we were working on Christian side, then on Muslim side, when Shiite side, Sunni side, etc. We, there is no choice for a medical doctor or humanitarian doctor. You don't have to say the good dead and the bad deaths, the good victim and the bad victim, not at all. Never. So we did. And uh, the neutrality is absolutely necessary. And don't mix up military, sometimes military intervention to protect, to protect some particular uh, project is good. But usually we are not, and we have, are never asking <laughs> about a military intervention. Don't mix up. And uh, I, I can give you a lot of examples. You were talking about Mali. Mali, the humanitarian French involvement, but French, it doesn't matter. International involvement was very, uh, uh, I mean, it was because the people were necessity. Who is calling? In humanitarian intervention, you have to understand that somebody was calling, some victims, a group of victims or a nation. We are not just 
let's say, choosing our victims and choosing our nation, not at all. Rohingya is a good example. We were there, not enough to alert the people, and I agree with your example. It was necessary to intervene, and I asked my government, unfortunately, I was not in, in charge of the government at the beginning, and of course it's a good example. We had to. Humanitarian intervention has to be before close to the victims, after a victim's call, but not because the government or the military people are asking us. Never. This is a neutral intervention. And this is, according to my opinion, the proudness of human being and the proudness of the international okay. community. If we are stepping back, and if I understand your slogan, uh, <laughs> we have to stop the humanitarian intervention and development intervention and everything and wait for the... So we have to let them die. I don't accept that. Thank you, Bernard Kushner. We come back to the other side now and debating for the motion in his opening statement, humanitarian intervention does more harm than good. Please welcome Frank Ledwidge, senior fellow at the Royal Air Force College and former military intelligence officer. Ladies and gentlemen, Frank Ledwidge. Ladies and gentlemen, it's simply not good enough to reframe this debate as humanitarian intervention. For those of us who've been involved in these failed efforts over the last 20 years, the predominant effort has been brutally Militarily, military and bloody. Ladies and gentlemen, let me take you down to, uh, to Basra, to Iraq, in 2004. Command group meeting. Middle of the night, the general showed up. It was a pep talk. Things weren't going so well. And the general said, guys, I want you to be aware of one thing. And here's what I want you to be aware of. We are the biggest and best gang in the province. And don't you forget it. And ladies and gentlemen, that was true. There were seven and a half thousand of us, heavily armed, well-trained, well-equipped, and with a reasonably clear idea of our vision and our mission, which was to secure one and a half million people. We failed to do that. We ended up hunkered down in a military base, defeated after some months. Cut now to Bosnia, the poster child for real humanitarian intervention. I was in that mission too. 60,000 of us there were, four armoured divisions. We had complete military dominance across the spectrum. No one would touch us. But ladies and gentlemen, that was in a country of four million people. Kosovo, very similar. We had complete dominance. What I would like to hear from our opponents tonight is where we are going to get 60,000 troops to secure a relative, even a relatively small country. Not so far away, let alone one of the invadables that Rajan was talking about which are likely to be much further away. And the kind of war we're involved in, let's be brutally frank about that. Non-international armed conflicts, internal strife, call it what you will, they're civil wars. And they are the most brutal, complex, and difficult operations that can be conceived. You were involved when you were in operations such as that in a three-dimensional chess match in the dark against multiple adversaries who tomorrow may be your allies, others, your allies today, may be your adversaries or your enemies tomorrow. Against a background where if you are not absolutely certain of where your objectives lie, ladies and gentlemen, you have no business being in such an environment unless you're absolutely sure that you can secure yourselves and the people you are there to protect. And nowadays, the will, the means, the material are no longer present within our uh, uh, polities, within our governments. We simply do not have the resources any longer to be able to sustain this kind of complex, deeply, deeply difficult operation. Mm. And now I turn possibly to the most important aspect and one which I think most of you will be intimately familiar, with which most of you will be intimately familiar. The politics of all this. Because let's be frank, who's going to be doing these interventions? Is Britain going to do it? Britain ran out of bombs after a couple of weeks in Libya. Is France going to do it? No. In all of the missions that we have sustained over the last 15 or 20 years, the United States 
have borne between 60 and 90% of the effort. Do you detect in the United States any political will for long, bloody, indeterminate, poorly planned operations at the ends of the earth, even if you assume there is some objective to them? Now, one of the themes of this conference is an increasing sense, I think, of insecurity in Europe. This is the final question I want to put to you. Is this what our armed forces should be doing at a time when, sooner or later, they may be, our defence forces, required to fulfil their advertised function of defence? I'm going to leave you with a thought. Just before I came here, I spoke to a friend of mine, one of my young officers in Iraq, badly injured. And I said I was coming to talk on humanitarian intervention. He said, well, there's a contradiction in terms for you. It's war. And he's quite right. No matter how you dress it up, when you conduct this kind of intervention, you are fighting a war. And there's one thing the last 20 years have taught us, is that you don't control war, it controls you. Ladies and gentlemen, support the motion. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Frank Lizzie. And our final speaker in round one, she will be arguing against the motion in humanitarian intervention does more harm than good, Corey Shaki, Deputy Director General of the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Ladies and gentlemen, Corey Shaki. So Bernard's and my opponents in this argument make a number of good points, but they conflate warfare and humanitarian intervention in a way that I think, <laughs> thank you for that, <laughs> in a way that I think confuses the subject some. Iraq and Afghanistan aren't humanitarian interventions, they're wars. We fought them for, we fought them for a reason, and that reason wasn't protecting the people of Iraq or Afghanistan. The reason was protecting the people of the United States and Britain and, other, and whatever you think about those wars. Uh, you should not, and the fact that we had humanitarian components to them, as I think uh, Western powers ought always to have in their warfare, uh, doesn't make them humanitarian interventions. Uh, humanitarian interventions are not always conducted by the military, although very often they need a military component in order to make them successful. And the reason that is, is because humanitarian crises aren't natural disasters. They're not earthquakes, they're not acts of God. They're acts of political malevolence. That's why, um, that's why violence is used for political purpose. That's what causes humanitarian crises. It's not a famine. It's an act of political violence by a government or another political actor. When that happens, um, that means a society is broken in some important way. So I think we ought not to set the standard that humanitarian interventions very often <coughs> fail to solve the underlying political problems, that they very often have unintended consequences, that they very often are complicated and get bogged down and you lose your focus. The undertaking is intrinsically extraordinarily difficult. It's a society in transition where, political vi where violence is being used for political purposes in order to gain political outcomes. Uh, but that doesn't mean they never work. Uh, so even if you don't buy Bernard's impassioned appeal that even one life deserves defending, there are practical, hard-edged policy reasons to engage in humanitarian interventions. For, and I will just offer two to you. One is that humanitarian interventions are often, humanitarian crises are often the prelude of worse humanitarian crises. And there the example is Syria, where if we, external actors had taken action in 2012 or 2013. You would not, you may have seen a bad outcome, but it is unlikely to be worse than half a million dead Syrians, 11 million people refugees. 
a to the tottering of the surrounding governments of Jordan, Iraq, Turkey, and the fracturing of political dialogue in those countries as a result of the pressure that the col violent collapse of Syria um, to, uh, brought about. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, more, so it, it's not true that doing nothing should leave us with a clear conscience. It's also not true that doing nothing has no strategic consequences. Russia's return to a power broker role in the Middle East, for example, is a direct consequence of us not intervening in the uh, terrible humanitarian crisis in the Middle East. Uh, so humanitarian interventions are seeking to address a political crisis that has resulted in violence in societies. It's difficult to get it right. We very often get it wrong. But sometimes we get it right. Um, I would argue that Kosovo is a success story. Did it require military force? Yes, it did. But did it also prevent Slobodan Milosevic and, and Serbs from doing a terrible, brutal injustice? to people who were ostensibly citizens of their country? Yes, that's a great outcome. We ought to celebrate that. Um, and I think it is a mistake to believe you can, that we can exist in innocence and purity in our own societies and our values. And this I learned from Randy Shuneman and the McCain campaign in 2008. You strengthen our values at their ragged edges. People don't make brave choices when they are in danger. You need to stand next to them and help them make good choices. Corey, I have to interrupt you because yep. your time is up, but what a nice finish that was. So it's over. Ladies okay. and gentlemen, that ends round one. And then we move on to round two, and round two is where the debaters take questions from me and from you, our live audience here in Brussels. They can also put questions to and, and interrupt one another, and I will be interrupting to move things along. In round two, we're going to explore what we just heard in the opening round. We heard from the team arguing for the motion, Frank Ledwidge and Rajan Menon. Uh, we heard an argument that um, uh, against humanitarian intervention on the grounds that they have been divisive, that they are applied selectively around the world, that they have uncontrollable consequences, and that the price to do it right is actually too high. And they say that this has dem been demonstrated again and again. The team arguing against the motion, Corey Shockey and Bernard Kushner, uh, they make the point that the right metric for humanitarian intervention is one life at a time. Uh, that uh, there is, however, a strategic component, that there are strategic reasons for participating in a humanitarian invention, and that there are consequences for inaction as well. So that sort of lays out where we are, but I, I want to jump a little bit to, to the news uh, of the moment and the week that we're in. We're debating this in a week, and in fact, on a day when Bernard, your organization, Doctors Without Borders, has put out a report that in the last two weeks alone in Syria, a thousand people have been killed. There are 4,800 wounded, according to Doctors Without Borders, which we consider a credible source. Now, your opponents have told, told us that to intervene in Syria now or even eight years ago would have been a fool's errand. Uh, you touched on this briefly in your opening, Corey. Would it have made a difference eight years ago? And would it be worth going in even now into Syria with the kind of intervention that you're talking about and supporting? Yes and yes. It would have made a difference then because it would have helped adjudicate the divisive, difficult com political debate internal to Syria. It would have restrained the ability of the Syrian government to use brutality as a weapon of political <laughs> control. It, the fact that we have done it poorly in some instances doesn't mean we haven't also done it well. Sierra Leone is a great example where the British government engineered an intervention. But let, let, me, let me stop you there because I would like to get you to, to those examples from the past. I just want to stay on the Syria question for a moment and take it to your opponent, Rajan Menon. The, the same question, your, or the, in response to, to Corey Shaki having just actually made a very powerful statement that, that drew applause, that it would have been, it, it, Syria was a case uh, then and now for humanitarian intervention. 
Well, I sense headwinds from the audience, but I think it would have been complete madness to intervene in Syria. I hold no brief for the blood-drenched Assad regime, but here's what happened. A peaceful demonstration was set upon by a savage government. Very quickly, the, operation, the opposition was radicalized, and within a matter of months, the groups with yes. protests on the ground were either Islamists or people who wanted to create a Salafi state in Syria. Arar al-Sham, Jaysh al-Islam, Jabhat al-Nusra. Now, if you send <laughs> weapons into a society where <laughs> alliances are shifting, borders are shifting, corruption is existing, do you have any guarantee that the weapons are going to go to the good guys? And who are the good guys as time rolled along? Look, let's not have a competition for compassion and tragedy here. That's not what this is about. Whether Frank and I care about dying people, of course we do. The question is, how do you make a very difficult decision that balances okay. eth ethics and strategy? Let's let Bernard Kushner respond to that. <clears throat> yes, another time we're talking about military intervention. You are right, the first scene of massacres was... You should be on this side. This no. No, on the country, yeah. you should be thinking about what I'm going to say. Oh, I am. This is, my dear, not a humanitarian intervention. We were in Syria. My people, the Médecins Sans Frontières and Médecins du Monde, they were already there. And we, take, we took care of the wounded people because you are starting the story with the massacre of the army, Bashar al-Assad army, uh, fighting on the, on the crowd. But formerly we were there, and we are still there, but this is so difficult and risky. Don't ask the humanitarian people to be heroes and to want to, 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 to sacrifice their life. Sometimes they are talking to the, about their family, thinking about their family. But we were there. Don't mix another time. Well, I'm let, not let me step in, Bernard. Let me step in because you asked me to listen to what you said, and I did. And I think you're a little off point for the thing that's at stake here, which is the question of putting military force into the game but we in, are or, not in, in order to, in order Don't to believe carry that human people, sir. Please, we are not responsible of the direction of the army. We are not responsible of the selling no, but the, No, no, but we, I, I have no, to, step in. I have to step in. I have not to yours. step in. The, we're, the, the, yeah, I don't want you to pivot away what we're, from what we're debating here. What we're debating yeah, here is, is whether it's, it, it's justified for a nation to put military force blood but not and toil. a nation. And, we are and humanitarian and people. We are not a nation. But we're asking what nation should be doing. No, That's the question but this here. is not absolutely not the problem. Okay, I, I don't want to be debating with you about, about what the debate is about. But may, I, may I take a swing at this? Yes, please but go ahead. Me too. Uh, me too. We are talking about humanitarian... No, no, no. It's her turn. No, Cor sir. Cor 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 no, sir. Corey, please. We are talking about please humanitarian sir. involvement. She's talking also about the Corey, take it. And, not and about synthesize. the nation and the army. Okay. So um, it seems to me that you are suggesting that any use of military force has to be an enormous use of military force or that anything else would have failed. Windows of opportunity open and close with time. Good question. And if, for example, in the specific case of Syria, if, for example, we had taken away the government's ability to use air power, that would have leveled the playing field and possibly prevented the radicalization uh, of, of rebels that you subsequently saw. Okay, Corey, Frank, I'd like, you to, Corey, I'd like you to actually answer Corey's point on point. I, I'm very keen to get stuck in here, but I can't let this pass. First of all, when you just take out a nation's air power, you don't do that. You make war on the state, and the Syrian air defense system is probably the strongest outside the Western world other than Russia. That would have been an extremely difficult undertaking, an act of war. And you might agree with me when uh, I were to say, if I were to say that perhaps Russia might have had something to say about that, given that they essentially run Syria's air defense system and much of its defenses. And also Iran, who have s both of whose nations, whether we like it or not, have serious interests in the region. No, the woulda, coulda, shoulda argument doesn't work. Because what, in my view, would have happened is we would, wouldn't have had green, white, and red flags in Damascus. We'd have had black flags in Damascus had we intervened with well, the 82nd Airborne Brigade. But you're, you're, brigade you're both talking about unknown outcomes. I mean, uh, I, you're talking about what would have happened exactly. if not. And and you're, but you're doing, point, you're doing the reverse. You're doing the reverse as I well, I don't though. believe in woulda, coulda, shoulda. 
So can okay, I Bernard, why don't you come back into Yes, it? please, but who is able to give the clearance to the humanitarian involvement? To whom do we have to address our question? Are we supposed to follow a government? We are not following a government. We are just answering to the victim's call. So when the victims are in Syria, we tried, and sometimes we succeeded, in sending, uh, let's say, this is, of course, this is a surgery for them, because it, unfortunately it was not something else. So when is the starvation or the welcome of the refugees? Also, the humanitarian involvement is necessary, and we don't have to give, so, to, to call for a permission. So there is a sort of vocation, one ban one, without any governmental decision. But you, you talked in your opening, Bernard, about sometimes some operations need military protection. That's what we're talking about. But of course, so, yes. So in, so in those situations, what, the, what your opponents are saying is, actually, that's never going to be a good thing. That's never going to work. And that's what's at stake here. John, we're not saying Sorry, it's never going to work. Okay. I'm saying it, generally speaking, it does more harm than good. Fair enough, That's because you case. also said the reverse. You said sometimes it doesn't work, but generally speaking, it does. Of course, so, yes. on, on hold. John, may I? Yes, Rajan. Look, I have great admiration for Mr. Kushner. He is a towering figure on the world stage and a true humanitarian. Absolutely. But let me ask you this, and this does not apply to, this is not, a, uh, there's, there's a but coming, but not yet, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> but l let me ask you this. If there is so much compassion in the West for suffering people, why haven't we done something that's much easier than taking out the Syrian air defense system or sending arms into Syria? Why is the World Food Program and the UNHCR going around with a begging bowl because rich countries have not provided what they promised? But Mr. Kushner. Kush now, one other thing. Go uh, One other thing. I, I, I had a very clever debating teacher. She was brilliant. And she told me, if you can't win the argument, reframe the debate. Mr. Kushner is talking about aid, relief, mediation, yes. and all this. No one disagrees with that. It's the sharp end of the stick that has made this debate so controversial. Why? Because we've seen it used, and often with cataclysmic consequences. And on the point that Iraq was not a humanitarian intervention, when they didn't find WMD, what did some of the humanitarian interventionists, not Mr. Kushner, Tony Blair, and others say? Well, we got rid of the dictator. You got rid of the dictator and turned the, the Middle East upside down. That's what you did. No, but All right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Bernard, finish your point. I want to move on to something else, but go ahead. Uh, uh, this is a big misunderstanding. <laughs> a big misunderstanding. Please enlighten me. You are not talking about humanitarian intervention. You are talking about military and sometimes with humanitarian, sometimes without. Mm -hmm. This is not... This is your problem, but this is not the problem of the people defending and offering to suffering to heal the victims. So John, this is not the same I, 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 So we're finding an interesting distinction that there are military interventions with a humanitarian component and that there are humanitarian interventions with a military component. And I think that's a little bit where the dividing line is. But I want to move to another topic that your opponents brought up again. I'll bring this to you, Corey. Um, they talked about having public support at home. So you're uh, an American citizen. You know the political situation there. There's a president who's arguing for an America first policy. There are national priorities like, the, say, the opioid crisis or education or even paying for infrastructure. Today, as your opponents say, how could, how could a president who wants to uh, compel, uh, can persuade the American people to be behind a humanitarian intervention using military force in somebody else's country, using their treasure and their blood? So my favorite reflection on the war weariness of the American public actually comes from the satirical newspaper, The Onion, <laughs> which argues that the nation's college professors are weary of the burden they're carrying of our wars, right? Because the nation's college professors aren't carrying the burdens of our wars. And in fact, um, the American public hasn't objected to the pre this president of the United States with his America first doctrine from increasing troops fighting in Afghanistan, from increasing troops fighting in Iraq, from increasing troops fighting in Syria, from increasing troops fighting in the Sahel. 
uh, those are not all humanitarian interventions, but if the American public were so weary of the burden of war, the president would be paying some political price for that. And in fact, what you see is the reverse, mm. right? Your average John, American John. gets drawn let's, out let's, into the world by the expressions of our values. Let's take that point to, the, to your opponents. Uh, 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 Frank, first. Whether, where, whether President Trump never sends another soldier abroad, the United States are in hock for $5.6 trillion for what's gone on over the last 16 years. That's the cost, never mind the 6,000 dead soldiers, 60,000 injured soldiers, and all the other political costs. You're in hock for that already. And I would suggest to you that there's very little appetite for another dollar being spent on that kind of intervention. I'll let Rajan go, and then you can have to Ladies and second. gentlemen, when all else fails, attack professors. <laughs> if, only, <laughs> if only we had the influence that Corey thinks we have. Look. I'm not talking about university professors. Who cares about them? I'm one. I, I'm negligible. I spend a fair amount of time with military people. You know how I started doing it? I worked for two years on the New York City suicide hotline and talked to our troops who come back. All we do is tie yellow ribbons around trees and wave the flags. They come back maimed with PTSD. And I have talked to them exactly about this. So please don't tell me that I'm sitting in an ivory tower. I have, ha I have friends who have served there. And I can tell you when you leave this echo chamber called Washington, D.C., and go to Missouri or Oregon or Texas, there is no stomach for this. And ladies and gentlemen, don't take my word for it. Pew has done very good polling on this. When you tell people that the cost rises in blood and treasure, Support falls off. Look it up. So, Bernard, on that point, you're, you're one of your successors today as we speak. Uh, on evidence, potential evidence that chlorine gas was used in Syria is talking about if, evident, if solid evidence comes of the Syrian regime now using chemical weapons, he would support intervention. Do you think the French public would be behind that? To answer precisely to your question, yes. Uh -huh. But it's too late. Unfortunately, we are witness inerts and not protesting at all, to the fall and the death of La Guta, close to Damascus. Mm -hmm. Are we supposed to send people? Yes, we tried. But it's impossible to pass the troops, to pass through, etc. But you were asking about Kurds. We didn't ask the President Hollande or the President Macron or the former President Sarkozy to help the Kurdish people. We did. We are not asking any power, any elected power. We are just doing it. And uh, in Afghanistan, this is obvious. I mean, uh, humanitarian involvement is not the cause of the involvement of the American people. But 9 September, yes. And uh, the people, the terrorist people, you had to react. But it was absolutely without any link with the inter uh, humanitarian intervention. We were, since 15 years, in charge of some region, Wardak, of Afghanistan. And we were close to the people. We were not just asking about our soldiers' involvement, mm -hmm. or your soldiers' involvement, or any soldiers' okay. involvement. I want to go to some questions from the audience now. The way this will work, I'm going to be given a microphone, and I will come and hold it for you so that I can take it back when I need to. Um, <laughs> and I just have a couple of rules on this. I want to, I want to ask you, do not debate with the debaters. Get them oh, no. to debate with each other. So actually, ask a question. Please make it terse. I don't mind if you state a short premise, but really ask a question. And you'll know it's a question if whatever you say naturally comes a question mark coming at the end of it. That means that it would work. But I'd like to come uh, right here, actually. And if you, uh, if you could stand up, and we'd like you to tell us who you are for the people who will be listening. And welcome to Intelligence Squared and German Marshall Fund debate. I I'm going to hold it. I'm going to hold it. <laughs> Hi, Dania Khatib. I think I'm the only one from Syria. I'm half Syrian, I'm half Lebanese. And I totally agree with Corey. And I've worked very closely with refugees. And for two, the two gentlemen who advocate that not to interference, what do you suggest how to end this? Let Assad kill another million, a half a million? And to now half of this population is refugee. Till all the population is refugee. And I'll tell you something from working very closely with refugees. The reason we have ISIS is because the America didn't intervene. When Hezbollah and the Shia militias and the Assad, they went and raped 11 years old, and they destroy mosque and put the banner of Yah Hussein. This was okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step in to actually take, to take your comment. 
to, to the point of what we're debating and what I want to do with your question, if, it's, if you're fine with that, is, is take it to the ISIS question, unintended consequences. They're saying the unintended, con she was saying the unintended consequences go in the other direction, that ISIS is there because Syria fell apart, because there was not earlier intervention. Uh, ISIS Frankly. is there because the Iraqi government, which is, or was at the time pretty much extra legal, supported and sustained Shia militias who were murdering Sunnis at this much the same rate that ISIS murdered Shias. And I don't think there's too much controversy about that. And that's an offshoot of the Iraq war. And by the way, uh, I myself used to see the conditions in which we kept some of those prisoners down in uh, Umm Qasr uh, prison camp. That's the source of ISIS. It has nothing to do with whether or not we did no. or did not intervene Corey. back in 2013. Okay. Let's let Corey Shaki, would you like to respond as well? You don't have to, but I want to give the, the crack at it. Uh, it certainly is true that the decisions that the United States and other uh, intervening powers in Iraq made, uh, both the decision to invade Iraq and then the decision to leave Iraq in 2011, facilitated the rise of ISIS. There's no question about that. But it, it's also a lesson about what solves these problems, right? Because the, if, you th if you think about the Iraq case, if the United, when the United States and other countries cared about good governance, helped establish an environment where uh, Iraqis felt secure, they were beginning to make brave political choices. In the parliamentary elections in 2010, for example, all the major slates were cross-sectarian. So you can see how this works when it works, but you can also see how it fails. This with is, this too is little local stuff, knowledge, Corey. with too mm. much hubris with too little commitment, with too little caring about solving the underlying political problems is how these fail. I have another question. Uh, I'll yes. hold it. Yeah, Thanks. I got Thanks. it. Yeah. Uh, my name is Natalia Kalada. I'm uh, coming from Belarus in dealing with Pifuminat. Uh, the question is, last week I met with uh, Sean Westmoreland. Uh, he is former US uh, Air Force veteran and uh, pilot of drones. And he truly believed in uh, humanitarian intervention. But uh, it's appeared that, uh, according to the report by his bosses, that he killed 200 plus enemies. And then uh, UN reported to him that he killed 359 civilians. So uh, his belief in humanitarian intervention disappeared. How would you comment? Is it worse to have those civilians deaths that are much higher than military enemies? Okay, so again, I'll boil that down to good example of unintended consequences. What does evidence like that do to your well, side? I'm not in charge of the drone system. I'm sorry. And, uh, but what about, okay, what about if, if you ask us if, if we are the humanitarian people, let's say, roughly, in favor of peace, yes, we are. And we proved it. That wasn't what the question not was. Though. The, the, but that wasn't the question. The question no, was but the, the question th was the murder by drones. Is it, is it worth, is it worth 300 it, people I'm, I'm killed sorry, versus 200 lives? I'm in charge sometimes because they call us. Okay, so let me, take it, let me take it to Corey then. Because no, it's but the sorry, you cannot change my mind. I'm not trying to it's change not, your mind at all. It's I, not a no, humanitarian no, I, 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 question. I'm, I'm trying to stay on the you point of the military action. You are misunderstanding. Actions. So I think that's a terrible and a tragic example <laughs> of where things can go wrong. But the fact that things can go wrong and bad things happen doesn't mean they always happen. It doesn't mean good things don't, aren't also. It seems to me that um, humanitarian intervention is merits necessary. doing is necessary. That's not an argument for doing it badly. It's an argument to improve your knowledge, especially your local knowledge, to prevent mistakes like that from tarnishing the good that needs to be done. Roseanne, do you have more to add? To, I mean, that, that question was sort of a big softball for your side, so I, if, if you can really add to it, yeah. otherwise I'd like to go to some questions. I, I just want to speak to you for a second. You've spoken with great eloquence and compassion, and I respect your knowledge. You've identified the problem, but you haven't elucidated the solutions. Now, on the business of people are learning, making proper choices, democracy, corruption, we have heard this for 15 years. There are serious problems in my country with infrastructure, poverty, income inequality. The out-year costs of these two campaigns that are unwinnable, by the way, 
is five trillion dollars, all right? And we want to have more of this? It's not feasible. There are many problems in the world that admit no solution. There are many more problems, ladies and gentlemen, that admit of no American solution. It is a tragic world. Nobody wants people to die here. That's not what we're arguing. It is what is feasible given the constraints, given what people are prepared to support at home, given the risks of intervention, which are considerable and have been sanitized by the other side. That's the issue. We're not having an arms race on compassion here. Bernard, I saw you exasperated. I'm desperate, I'm yeah. desperate yes. Yeah. Let's take down to the side, and I'll come to the sir. Hi, Bart Sheftrick of the European Commission's European Political Strategy Center. A quick question for both sides. Um, for Frank and Rajan, what do you make of the relatively successful 2014 uh, humanitarian intervention to protect the uh, CDs in Syria. You didn't mention this instance, but it was a relatively limited instance of the use of force that saved about 50,000 people. Do you consider that to be a mistake? The pr primary thrust of humanitarian intervention is that to the extent that you could do something good, as Corey pointed out, with limited resources, you should do it. And for your side to win, you would have to argue that that intervention, which didn't have any sort of secondary or tertiary um, consequences, was actually a mistake. And for Corey, if I may. Uh, no, I'm gonna, just one question. Okay. Thanks, but it's a great question. No, More evidence from the other side. Frank, yeah. yeah I, I'd like to, to develop You guys that. are really doing the, the full Bill Clinton here with the walking around thing. Okay, it's, 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 it's your choice. Yeah, I'd, li I'd, li I'd, like, to, uh, I'd like to address that dire directly. It's not our case that humanitarian, military, military humanitarian intervention is always going to cause more harm than good. It can cause good. If it's well planned, limited in duration, and strategic in nature, the Zedis is one example. However, I'd also point out to you that four million Iraqis, Iraqi Christians, are now outside their own country. They were not uh, protected, and uh, very many other uh, minorities within that country. So this was a very narrow, very limited intervention, and as a, as a result, successful. The same applies too, to some degree, by the way, uh, as you said earlier, Corey, to the Sierra, Sierra, Sierra Leone intervention in 99. Extremely limited, extremely to the point, and very, very short. But I, I hear Corey and Bernard arguing that if it meets the conditions you just set, then their side wins. No, well, I, 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 Corey, you are basically saying that, that, right? So and, I'm and, you can name, and Corey can name one intervention in the last 20 years, which was, by the way, an off-the-books action by a British general that was not authorised by his government, a rather brave action by General Richards. That's the only example you can point to. Plus the aid drop, because that's what it was. It was very little military, military involvement other than that to the Yazidis a couple of years ago. So and that's the, it. I think the intervention in East Timor, led by Australia, yes, and in Kosovo. counts as a success. I think Kosovo counts as success. I think the 1991 protection of what we now come to think about as the Kurdish territories of northern ago. Iraq, which was not a narrow or a limited intervention, was an enormous success. Another question here? Um, hi, I'm Nancy Lindborg with U.S. Institute of Peace, and um, I actually think we have three debates going on here. Um, at least, at yeah, least. At least, but even among the four. Um, I think, you know, the humanitarian community has long seen that action alone by humanitarians will not get to resolution of these problems and have welcomed different approaches. I'm struck by the lack of uh, discussion in this debate on the political dimension. Can you, can you target in with a question then? What, what, where's the political action in, this, in the discussion of, of uh, humanitarian interventions? Ra Rajan, do you take what the intent uh, of that or, question Only is? if you can explain what you, I'm not quite, it's not your fault. I'm not understanding your question. What do you mean when there's no we, we've, we've, it, we've made a very binary between humanitarian actors or military actors, yeah. but the political, yeah. diplomatic, yeah. Um, <laughs> inner, the, the ways in which you want to try to invoke the, the long... Yeah, do, you mean, do you mean aren't there, other tech, aren't there other methods other than military force natural, on a spectrum? On a yes. spectrum. John, I, I don't think anybody disagrees with that. disasters, John? they're political problems, and they, of course, yeah. require political solutions. Um, that that sometimes military force is a necessary component of, very always other tools are also necessary. So we have a question or a follow-up on that. I'm going to hold the microphone. I'll hold the microphone. I'll hold the microphone. 
I'll hold the microphone. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I'm from Morocco. Uh, I want to ask the panelists, don't you think that today we have the crisis in the international bodies and instrument? I think today we have, of course, we have humanitarian crisis, we have refugees, but today I think that the Security Council should review its tools as far as... Act do, do you have a question, though? I, 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 okay. I need something that... Okay. Do you think we should review the tools, UN and Britain Woods agreements? And, and I want to add to that question, would a review of the tool, is there a way, I think this gentleman is basically saying, is there a way to improve the processes to turn the tide against the situation in which you're arguing? In other words, is there something to be learned from the past to apply to the future, a set of guidelines to do this right that would, you know, 30 years from now change your mind about how things went? Well, we might consider some political solutions, as, as you suggested. I was talking to a NATO official a couple of uh, months ago concerning Syria, and I asked whether or not we might consider, and this isn't political, it's more financial, why instead of sending our troops, American troops, British troops, European troops to somewhere like Syria, we might consider, oh, I don't know, targeting some uh, oligarchs in, in London, making sure that they have, for example, immigration problems. And this senior NATO, NATO official said, yeah, you know what? I, I put that to, to, to my, uh, my chiefs, and uh, it was rejected. This is not the kind of solution that it was felt to be appropriate. Instead, we devolve immediately to military solutions. Bernard. I already told you that we are mixing up everything, but I'm going to answer about migrants. In, a question. They are dying in the Mediterranean Sea by thousands. Two French boats or three French boats are in charge of rescuing them. Themselves, we didn't ask the government. One is Médecins Sans Frontières, the other is Médecins Du Monde. This is a humanitarian intervention and not a military intervention. And we have a lot like that. Starvation, disease, Ebola. Who is the first at the first rank to intervene. Humanitarian people, do you want to suppress that or not? This is not always a question of war and peace. This is a question of human being and answering to suffering. That's all. Roshan. If, if this were a debate about mediation, providing relief to refugees, and so on, <laughs> there would be no debate. Frank and I agree with this. What has made the project of humanitarian intervention controversial is the military dimension. Now, I take fully, I take fully, now hang on, I take fully Mr. P Kushner's point that there are other forms of it, but we are talking about the most pernicious forms. Now, can I quickly respond to a, a point that Corey made? I'll be very fast, very fast. East Timor and Kosovo. Here's the thing. The intervention in East Timor was possible because the TNI, the Indonesian military agreed to stand down and not resist. Had they not, it would not have happened. In Kosovo, NATO pilots were restricted to flying no lower than 20,000 feet, even though the Serbs scaled up the killing. This goes to my point that the capacity to really suffer and die on behalf of these missions, ladies and gentlemen, is limited. That is a political question, not just a military question. Rajan, thank you very much. That concludes round two of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate, where our resolution is humanitarian intervention does more harm than good. Now we move on to our third and final round. In our third and final round, the debaters make closing statements, again, uh, one at a time. Those will be two minutes each. Immediately after that, we're going to have you vote a second time. And I want to explain now that in our debate system, victory goes to the team whose numbers have changed the most between the first and the second vote. So it's not the absolute vote, it's the difference between the first and the second vote. Let's move on to round three, closing statements from each debater in turn. Our resolution is humanitarian intervention does more harm than good. Leading off with his closing statement, Rajan Menon, he is professor at the City College of New York and senior research scholar at Columbia University. Two minutes, right, John? Two, Two minutes. minutes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you were to visit my study at home, you would see bookshelves groaning with books on humanitarian intervention. And I want to tell you a personal story. I started on, out on this side of the debate partly from reading about the incredible work that people like Mr. Kushner do. I had enormous sympathy for the intervention in Bosnia. I do not want people to die, that's not what this is about. It was a long and difficult and painful road to me for, for me to come to where 
I am coming. We have to, in this tragic world, read Max Weber or Thucydides, filter moral issues through difficult circumstances. We may have people who are being put under enormous distress and would like to do something, but a president has to, or a prime minister, this goes to you, ma'am, has to put an enormous amount of attention on the political realities and the military risk. You've been in a very energetic crowd, and I sense where the momentum of the crowd is. But please don't misunderstand us. We don't take any joy in arguing the position. It is not the idea that humanitarian intervention is always bad, as witnessed the gentleman's question on the Yazidis. I think that was a good move. I supported it. The proposition is not whether it is always bad. That's not what we're arguing here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rajan. Again, the resolution, humanitarian intervention does more harm than good. And here to make his closing statement against the motion, Bernard Kushner, co-founder of Doctors Without Borders and former French foreign minister. Let me say that your sentence is not good. You have to write, humanitarian bar and military intervention does more harm than good. It will be better and it will be more close to, let's say, the question you're asking. This is not humanitarian intervention, but humanitarian and military or under military umbrella. It will be better because you were never talking about humanitarians, that is to say volunteers, not guided by government people close to the others. Second, of course, you quoted some of the, the point where it was necessary to intervene, but it was impossible to intervene everywhere because it, a, a state and an army, especially an American army, or the, the British army or the French army are not bad. But humanitarian people are completely a little group, few people, under their own decision, under their own charter. This is not because we were asking, as I told you, the, 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 the approval or the clearance from any government. So do you want to suppress that? Certainly not. You don't want to suppress the military intervention in, with humanitarian, but do you want to suppress the only unique humanitarian intervention? I don't think so. Do you want to suppress the way we were talking about uh, Ebola epidemic, pandemic? No, certainly not. So this is always the case. We are, let's say, answering the maximum or the minimum what we were able to answer to human suffering. It was a progress compared to the Second World War. We did something against barbarian people, against the, the nature of, uh, let's say, the oppression. <coughs> Do you want to suppress that? I don't think so. Thank you, Bernard Kushner. Once again, the resolution, humanitarian intervention does more harm than good. And here to make his closing statement, Frank Ledwidge, senior fellow at the Royal Air Force College and former military officer. Ladies and gentlemen, in such dangerous things as war, the errors which proceed from a spirit of benevolence are the worst. Now, Clausewitz, the famous Prussian general and theorist, said that just, uh, just under 200 years ago, and it holds as much today, holds as much water today as it did then. The disasters and catastrophes, the wreckage of which we're dealing with now over, over the last 15 years, should give anyone pause before any kind of military intervention is considered. But there are times, aren't there? And it's not our case on this side of the house that humanitarian intervention can never work, only that, generally speaking, it does more harm than good. And one major example of that was revealed by Bernard himself in his last but one speech, and that's Libya. And Bernard doesn't need reminding, nor do you, as to why it is that all those thousands of refugees and migrants are dying in the Mediterranean. That's because of the appalling mess we made of Libya. I include myself in that. There are times, ladies and gentlemen, when we're tempted to do great and good things. Let me give you an analogy. We can see on the top of a mountain that there are people in desperate need of help. We know we should do something. We know something must be done. 
But we also know that if we go on that mountain to rescue them, we don't have the kit, we don't have the oxygen, we don't have the resources to help them. We should do something, but we can't. Ladies and gentlemen, I was in Beirut a couple of years ago and I met a young lady uh, very similar to the young Syrian woman who spoke before. And I was there rather pompously to find out what Britain could do to uh, ameliorate the situation there. I'll never, never forget her response when she found out that I'd already been involved in several of these failed interventions. She said, haven't you done enough? Thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen. Support the motion. Thank you, Frank Rodgers. And our final speaker in closing rounds, Corey Shaki. She is Deputy Director General of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, making her closing statement against the motion. Corey Shaki. So our opponents in this discussion are big-hearted and well-meaning and made a lot of good points. Um, humanitarian interventions do often fail. Too often governments engage in the desire to do something without thinking their way through what ought to be done, how to limit it in a way consistent with their limited interests in a particular problem, or with the limited opportunities that a particular problem uh, offers us. Uh, but to suggest that humanitarian intervention does more harm than good overlooks the numerous cases where it has done more good than harm. The Yazidi example, uh, intervention in the Balkans, both in Bosnia and in Kosovo, uh, interventions in East Timor, Sierra Leone, the French intervention now uh, in Mali is definitely doing more good than harm. These sometimes have a military component. They very often need a military component to freeze the situation in place because they're the re these crises are the result of political choices by political actors. And you're exactly right. Doing it well requires knowing a lot, coming in with a sense of humility and not trying to overwhelm local actors, but to set them up for success. And I still think the best commentary on this ever was from Edmund Burke, who said, the use of force alone is but temporary. It may subdue for a moment, but it does not remove the necessity of subduing again. And a society, a country, is never to be governed that must perpetually be conquered. In order to do humanitarian intervention well, you have to solve the underlying political problem. You have to create the basis for a different kind of sustained political agreement going forward. Thank you, Corey Shockey. And that concludes our closing statement. And now it's time for you to tell us which side you feel has argued the best. We want to ask you again to go to the app and go to the section on interactivity and look for the vote. And once again, you'll be given the option to vote on exactly the same resolution. Humanitarian intervention does more harm than good. You have the choice of four, against or undecided. And I'll repeat, uh, we'll, we'll have the results in about uh, two and a half, three minutes, so you'll know who's our winner. But I'll repeat, we give victory to the team whose numbers have changed the most in percentage points from the first vote to the second vote. While that's happening, um, something I would just like to hear from the panelists. The competition part is over. I'd actually just like to hear a little bit of conversation, uh, given the, the flow of ideas here. Uh, and and on, by the way, on the topic of the flow of ideas, uh, you are a terrific audience, and I want to say, you really were. And uh, um, the questions really move things forward for us in the way that we like to have happen. I knew a lot of people didn't get to ask their questions, but you can storm the stage afterwards and chat with the debaters. But for everybody who got up and asked a question, they all worked today, so thank you very much. But I want to uh, ask the debaters. Um, I'll start with you, Rajan. Just did, did you hear anything from, from this? And this is the question I'm going to put to all of you. Did you hear anything from your opponent that made you think twice about your position did you, or, or more deeply or catch you by surprise? Anything that you, you heard from the other side that you said, okay, I see what they're saying? Think about it in a different way. I think I was very moved by Mr. Kushner's eloquent statement about how much good can be done without the military dimension. I think he's absolutely right on that. I think Corey is correct that carefully planned and executed under certain circumstances, those circumstances I think are rare, humanitarian intervention can work. We have never argued the proposition that it cannot work. These are two formidable intellectuals. I've enjoyed debating them. Thank you both. Okay. Corey, how about you? 
the Libya case, I think, is a, an incredibly strong case for the opposition side of the argument, where we unquestionably made a terrible situation worse by our half-hearted and incremental meddling in it. In the extreme moment, that is, when the decision was made to do something, I think the overwhelming sense in the West that disaster was imminent might not have been correct. And I, I think you can make that case even more strongly than perhaps you did. But I thought you guys played a difficult hand, especially with an audience of like this kind that cares about creating positive change. I think you made a difficult case extraordinarily well. Yeah, I, I, and actually, you had you had thought the audience you you got some applause um, throughout the evening, and and I wasn't sure you thought you would get that. That was my mother. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Frank. Well, uh, but Bernard was my boss in Kosovo for for a year and a half, and it's a great honor to to to, to face off uh, against him. Uh, concerning concerning difficult arguments, yeah, Corrie's Corrie's final points about that the, the list of limited interventions was very effective. Mm -hmm. um, Notwithstanding Libya and so on, and uh, uh, she she has a reputation for being the voice of reason, and I think for really fulfilled that reputation. Hey, tonight. thank you. <laughs> but do you, do, Frank, do you, sort of to go back to a question that came up in the debate proper, do you see a future where we can perf not perfect but get better at this thing? No, I see. I see it honestly going da downhill. You uh, do. Yeah, we, we, I think the unipolar moment's passed, and there's too many, simply too many military tensions to, okay. to justify. It. And Bernard, how about you? What, from your opponents, did you hear anything that made you think twice? You get to say no. You know, you I, <laughs> I devoted my life to humanitarian intervention. I think, according to your position, I was wrong. But I don't I regret anything that. because I'm talking that. to the victim. Second point, don't accuse the vaccination to be responsible of epidemic and pandemic. Don't accuse the anti-tuberculosis to, to be responsible of tuberculosis. Humanitarian intervention is not a responsible. It does good do, let's say, provoke success sometime and never harm uh, against the people. Never, 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 never. OK, thank you very much. And thanks, everybody, for all that. I just wanted to. Um, very briefly, for those of you who uh, might be based in New York, to let you know um, that our next debate, if you're interested, um, is going to be uh, on the, uh, the t well, let me put it this way. I'm just going to read this card because I was going to try to ad lib it, but it's too much, too dense. Um, <laughs> you know we'll be bringing result. some exceptional <laughs> debaters to the stage, including uh, integrative medicine pioneer Deepak Chopra, Overstock CEO Patrick Byrne, uh, Mozilla chairwoman Mitchell Bates. And the Financial Times, Jillian Tett. The topics that we'll be taking on this spring include the future of religion, Bitcoin, and net neutrality. You can go to our site to get more information on all of our debates. We would love to see you there. And I'm betting there are people in this audience who will be on our stage as debaters someday. Our website is iq2us.org. Okay, I'm told that I have the results in. Remember, we had you vote twice, and it's the difference between the first and the second vote that determines our winner. In the first vote, on the resolution, humanitarian intervention does more harm than good. Before the debate and polling you here in Brussels, 30% of you agreed with this motion, 51% were against the motion, and 19% were undecided. In the second vote, the team arguing for the motion their first vote was 30%, their second vote was 34%. They gained Yahoo. four percentage points. That is the number to beat. The team against the motion, they went from 51%. Their second vote was 59%. They pulled up oh, nine, eight percentage points. That means the team arguing against the motion, humanitarian intervention does more harm than good, well is declared our winner. Congratulations to them. Thank you for me, John Donvan, and Intelligence Squared US and the German Marshall Fund. We'll see you next time. Congratulations. 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 Everybody, this was such a pleasure for us. We are so grateful My to the German Marshall Fund. Uh, coffee's outside. We'll see you later.